All righty, we are now recording. Uh, so uh, this is just going to be a quick overview of some of the concepts we've covered uh, over our past few weeks uh, with uh, plenty of opportunities for questions um, from uh, Java, if, if you have any, or uh, and there'll be moments where the, hopefully the tutors will be able to reiterate some of these points uh, that we've made going along here. So. So, this is just a quick overview, as I mentioned. First thing I wanted to do was just recap some of the different uh, concepts that we talked about a little bit, including a couple today with those final two problems. Um, so if uh, different folks would like to just kind of recap some of this information, uh, that would be much appreciated. Um, Mallory, if you wanted to start us off talking a little bit about the order of operations stuff, and we'll just kind of go through our list here. Sure thing. Yeah, so that first problem that we had dealt with order of operations, and we talked about PEMDAS, what each of those meant, parentheses, exponent, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, and how multiplication, division, and addition, subtraction are kind of at the same quote unquote level and how we want to move from left to right when they're on the same level. But prior to that, if there are parentheses, you want to do those first, then exponents, then yada yada, until you get into as simplified as you can. So order of operations using PEMDAS. OK, thank you. And um, fractions, does anybody want to just recap a little bit some of the stuff we talked about with issues of fractions and dealing with those? Yeah, I can talk about it. Great. So one one of the things we always want to, you know, simplify it. This I guess the very first thing you need to know, and and so then also to to deal with multiple common uh multiple uh, fractions, we already always want to get to the uh, you know lowest common denominator, and then we can sometimes use the magic wand to get to some denominators to solve some problems. Uh, you know, one can be anything like, as the example here is seven divided by seven, eight divided, or divided, eight divided by eight, whatever you need to get to the uh, fractions to get a common denominator you need, that can be very helpful. And then uh, you can always, you know, multiply the uh, fractions and together and then try to remember you can cross out some of the things and the other thing kind of goes back to the question we just did, that uh, you always have to remember you cannot divide by zero. Your, your denominator cannot be zero. So you have to you know, pay attention to that. So, you know, some of the, that will limit some of the range of the variable. Thanks, Owen. And yeah, we had a, a number of, you know, one of the things when I was, you know, trying to remember how to do some of these problems and, and was dealing, you know, what do I do with fractions and how do I divide and the whole cross multiplication thing was something I didn't really remember. And many of these concepts are going to feel pretty basic, right? Going to feel somewhat elementary, but you'd be, uh, you might be surprised to see how much this sort of stuff comes back up again right even as you're trying to get through a finite math class let's say in college or something like that 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 the the assumption is the hope is that you would already that you would remember how to do these things or that you would know where to go to look at you know to refresh your memory about how to, how to do these kinds of steps um radicals how uh does anybody want to just quickly say anything about that this kind of goes into that simplifying your answer concept, which you're going to see a lot. People are going to ask for that. I can do it real fast. Great. Thanks, Ryan. So the important thing with radicals, remember, is perfect squares. So the perfect squares are the ones you can uh, you usually use to simplify radicals. And so if you always forget your perfect squares, just remember it's just a number of times itself. So in this case, it would be 2 times 2, 3 times 3, 4 times 4, 5 times 5. If you keep doing that, you want to see... Uh, all different perfect squares you can take out. And once you find a perfect square, you kind of separate the radical into that, and then you can take the square root of that, 
One second, my dog's trying to get in. Can someone else do this? Uh, I, I can take over. Uh, <laughs> so basically, whatever number is inside of the radical, you're trying to break it into pieces and so that some of those pieces are perfect squares so that you can take it out of the radical because that's how we're going to simplify it. So prime factorization is really important for this. If you take a prime factorization of a number and you find that there are two of the same, so like there are two twos, I think that's how we did it when we did it in tutoring, um, then you know that there's a four in there. So I think the number is 60, right? Yes. Okay. So I think we ended up with two twos. So you know that 60 is divided, is divisible by two, but it's also divisible by two times two, which is four, which is, which is a perfect square that we can, we can take out of the radical. Right. Thank you to uh, Ryan and Mallory as a group effort. Well, thank you, Mallory. <laughs> um, so, and, uh, we're kind of moving into the factoring conversation uh, previously alluded to. Um, does anybody want to just recap the sort of why we need to, to be mindful about factoring? And we actually did a little bit of this today as well. Yeah, I can do it. Thanks, Derek. So factoring is essentially looking for, you'll see something really complicated, like in the last problem, like XY minus 3X or something like that. And you have to, Factoring is just looking at that and going, oh, there's an X in both of those things. I can just take the X out and be left with Y minus seven. Or in another way, you could say like three X plus 12, you could say that's like, you could take a three out of that because three is a factor inside of 12 as well. And is a factor inside of three X and be like three times the quantity x plus four it's just a really helpful way to move stuff around in order to see relationships in the problem that make you divide by things and to simplify in a way that will give you an answer that makes sense and just to kind of spin off of that thank you and it, that even further and then there's also the possibility of moving kind of all of the same things to one side of the equation and whatever's left over <laughs> to the other side of the equation. Like if you were trying to solve for X or solve for Y, you'd want to kind of isolate that on one side of the equation and then put everything else on the other side as well. So there's also, there's kind of multiple ways to think about that a little bit. Um, exponents, natural logs. I got this one. Awesome. So, um, before I get into that specifically, I just wanted to say in general that mathematicians, when they, when they are using something really often, they'll come up with notation so that they can refer back to it without some long-winded explanation. So if you're encountering notation that you're unfamiliar with, that a mathematician has, has come up with, that, that is used commonly, go back to the definition because that's really how we solve this problem with with log is we went back to what is this saying and then we translated it from what how it was written in the problem to how it was defined and that's how we were able to solve it using like the little snail method which Javanique you said you had learned that in school which is really cool um so yeah, that, that would be my, my general takeaway from this question is if you don't know the notation, look it up, ask somebody, try to figure that out because that'll probably help you figure out where to go from there. But with this one, we just use the definition of log using a little snail method to move it into a notation that we could actually um, do algebra with so we could figure out the answer, but it just ended up being exponents. Great, thank you, Mallory. I just saw a typo, so I'm making a note for myself. Uh, so, um, so yeah, and then we'll we'll end up with uh, the and I think the the whole snail method, PEMDAS, as another acronym. You know, we all often will learn different things, different ways of remembering uh, uh, how to do certain types of processes, particularly in math. Um, 
And so I think what uh, Mallory alluded to was, was useful to think about in terms of, you know, we, we all are coming at this with slightly different ways of being taught previously. And so um, there are times when we are going to then see parts of a question or something written in a particular way that we're not going to be familiar with necessarily. And so uh, to that point, I think that, that, that being able to to look stuff up, uh, having resources, you know, at kind of at your fingertips uh, to be able to figure out, uh, you know, what's really being asked. Uh, you know, in th those instances, Google and other types of uh, resources can be your friend uh, to try to uh, remember how to do something that you may have known how to do previously and don't remember, or that you just learned to do a different way using different terminology, different vocabulary. So. Uh, or representation. So uh, that very much speaks to kind of the last point here is about the equation for a line. Uh, I could take that one. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. So for the equation of a line, yeah, the standard equations y equal mx plus b, or there's yeah other ways that people have learned it in high school or wherever. But the important pro like part of solving this problem is first figuring out your slope. Look at the line that you're given, try to find two points, so an X1, a Y1, and an X2, and a Y2. And then use the um, slope equation where you'll take Y1 minus Y2 over an X1 minus an X2, and that'll give you your slope. Once you have your slope, you should take then one of those points that you had from like your X1, your um, Y1, and then plug that into the y equals mx plus b equation with your slope to find b and that should hopefully give you your equation of your line and then yeah you could also yeah double check by using another point in the line to make sure that you get the same b value but yeah does not if anyone else has any other tips for this go ahead Well, I'll just at one point, sometimes depends, like, for example, the one of the question that the question we did, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we could easily figure out the y interception first. So it, I guess it depends on the, the on the graph or or, or the, the question, how they word it, if, you know, whichever one, whichever you want, uh, anyone you can figure out first, the slope or the interception, you can just use that first to help you, you know, make the question easier. But if you have no idea how to, how to, you know, which one should get first, just, you know, kind of go with what Josh says, um, figure out a slope for this, the kind of like a safest way to do so. And yeah, and then one more thing, also make sure though that slope that you get makes sense. So like a positive slope should be increasing from left to right. And that negative slope should also, a negative slope should be decreasing. Anybody else? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, both Owen and, and, and Josh, you know, covered a lot of the, of the ground. It really does depend somewhat on what you're given, right? The information that you have, uh, uh, where you're starting from, you know, in terms of clarity of your graph, if you can interpret what the uh, y-intercept is right off the bat, um, do they give you actual points? <laughs> or are you having to try to kind of glean those from, from the visuals that you have? Um, and once you have points and start calculating your slope, and some people use that phrase rise over run, and it's my, probably a more old fashioned phrase, um, but I remember that one, um, as another way to think about, you know, for however many places you move forward on the X axis, you go up a certain number on the Y, and that that's determining sort of your slant and whether it's a positive slant or a negative slant <laughs> um, is, is, is gonna be, help you, uh, figure that out too so that whatever answer you get as Josh says you know makes sense so that's why the whole notion of figuring out if there are ways to kind of double check your what you yeah. end up with um, one more thing though yeah so like you said rise over run that's basically so if your slope was say three fourths three will be your rise and your four will be your run so that means from a point on the graph that means you're going to go up three and then to the right four to clarify rise over run. Thank you. And so that's more of a Y over X kind of situation, really, thinking about it in those terms. Okay, cool. 
Thank you. And this kind of leads me to the point that I wanted to really underscore um, as sort of a summary uh, position here. It's really important when you are dealing with uh, college math, and this is really applicable to any discipline or any course, um, you know, that there are key terms, vocabulary, and we've talked about that, and we're, we were discussing some of that just a moment ago, uh, that are really need to be understood and defined in, uh, for you to be able to proceed. And so we've heard references to elements, which can also be talked about as out possible outcomes, sample space, what does that mean? The whole universal set concept that Darius alluded to earlier today, or the you know, population of people you may have in a group, and then you're being asked about what's going to happen for this subset versus that subset or what's the probability that this is going to happen or that's going to happen right those are the kinds of questions we see a lot in in uh, certain math courses uh, the experiment can just sometimes be referencing just what's this problem what are what 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 are we trying to figure out here right and that sometimes graphical representations like the Venn diagram that we saw earlier or drawing a tree. I believe we had at least one problem where we did a tree. Uh, what can also be referenced, I guess, is a decision tree a little bit that um, to understand the logic behind a problem or a question. Because a lot of college math, and this is kind of specific to IU Bloomington, but uh, particularly that finite mathematic courses, a lot of times people ask, well, what's that class about? Why, why do I have to take it? What, what's the deal? And uh, frequently the response that I've heard given that seems persuasive to me is that, you know, in many ways, finite is about sort of helping you expand your ability to use math in a way to address sort of questions of logic, of probability. It's a preparatory class for statistics in a lot of cases. And so, uh, you know, recognizing the types of questions that would fall into that category can be really useful because then you know, oh, well then maybe I do need to draw out a graph here, or I need to actually draw the um, uh, distribution for this thing to understand standard deviation or this or that or some of those kinds of concepts. And so uh, the types of problems that you'll see often in a first year math class, such as finite, would be uh, if some, this thing happens, then this happens. And then if that happens, and then the next step in the tree would be okay. And then depending on which one of those outcomes you get, then it's going to go in a different direction again, right? And if I end up in one house, in Hogwarts, then this happens. But if I end up in this other house in Hogwarts, then this other thing happens, right? That's when the tree starts making sense. Similarly, like the question we just did with everybody with the apps on their phone, you know, we've got a group of this many people and then there's subgroups. And some people can fall into one, more than one category that there's intersections between these groups of people. And often what we're being asked to do is figure out who's in this group, but not in that group, or what's the overlap look like and things like that, right? So those are the times when thinking about it, not just in a written form, but maybe in a more graphic form can be helpful to us to walk through what you're actually being asked and how to get there and to understand the logic behind it, okay? And that whole notion of close, careful reading is the key, right? That, and this will be true for any college class that somebody would be in, that, uh, but it's particularly true, I think, uh, in math courses, that you have to read it closely. What is the question asking us, right? Not only is it a function of, you know, wanting to be sure that you are approaching it the right way so that you can get to the right answer, but, you may also find, as uh, we have done, that, you know, you may be making more complicated than it really is, right? On occasion that, you, that you're almost trying to do more work than, than is required for the question, right? And if you're in a situation where you're in a timed sort of environment, you don't want to spend, you know, more time than you need to on a problem if you can move on and, and, and tackle the next one. 
right? So that, and in terms of just sort of a test taking strategy, that would be something you would want to consider. And I think that this holds up whether you're learning in a face-to-face -face environment or in an online environment or some hybrid of the two, which is to say, you have to be as precise as you can be when you're doing all phases of your assignments and the requirements for a particular class, whether it's the homework, whether it's essay, writing an essay, drafting, and, and, and then polishing it for a, a final project, uh, group work, actually sitting and taking exams, timed, take home, whatever it may be, uh, you know, accuracy, precision, being deliberate about it are all, I think, key things to consider uh, that you want to be trying to, to do as much as you possibly can. Okay. So to that end, part of that is being able to utilize uh, resources effectively. And I'm just going to walk through these really quickly. Um, the information about uh, these, uh, this presentation uh, will be up on the Canvas page for the Summer Learning Institute, uh, as well as uh, information so you can uh, use the links uh, effectively for the resources that are going to be at IUB. I want to make sure I give each of the tutors a chance to give a little piece of advice here to as we end. But the academic support centers are the uh, evening time sort of tutoring uh, an academic sport that's available. We focus on math and writing. We do have some other subjects as well. We will be doing uh, all of our help uh, online for the upcoming 2020-21 academic year. Uh, as I say, we will start the second week of classes in the fall. And you would just be contacting the program and the department and we would be sending you the information about the links uh, to use the tutoring. There are lots of other office um, resources as well. And uh, I wanted to draw people's attention to office hours. Uh, it can be an underutilized academic resource for a lot of students, particularly new students. And so um, they should be listed uh, on the Canvas page or the syllabus for each of your classes. And you wanna be sure to take advantage of those uh, if at all possible. Um, in our current situation, it may very well be that uh, the office hours would be happening online as well uh, in a Zoom environment or something similar. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, a lot of times students do not use those as much as they could, but sometimes the types of questions you might have about how to write a particular paper, how to work on a certain type of problem may be best answered by the, the faculty member, the instructor. Uh, that's going straight to the source is often a good, a good answer. Um, but that there are other academic support resources like the Math Learning Center, departmental review sessions, uh, math has calculus reviews, chemistry, um, biology, the computer science, uh, the Luddy School. There are different options that are available that are going to be online too or have been online. Uh, for a little while now, uh, where you can go and drop in if you have questions about homework, uh, particular courses, uh, and, and get some help uh, directly from the departmental review sessions as well. Uh, and then the Math Learning Center is sort of the daytime version of the math help that the Academic Support Center provides in the evenings. Uh, they tend to function in much the same way. You may have a Canvas group page to go to or um, an email that you would then have to know, contact in order to receive the information about the Zoom links. Student Academic Center, another option uh, here on IUB's campus. They have a very nice online video series called Success TV uh, off their webpage uh, that provides uh, a lot of nice information too. Um, very quick videos uh, to watch that deal with various academic support issues. Writing Center. Um, Disability Services for Students, um, another office that can be very useful uh, for students uh, if appropriate. Um, the University Division Academic Advising uh, does have a very nice web page that I've linked to it that really gives us an overview of lots of different academic resources, right? So um, whether you're looking for language tutors, some of these are private tutoring situations, others are free services, they try to indicate kind of what they uh, do in each one. 
and many of the uh, information, you know, much of the information here would also be similar to uh, what is available uh, on our other pages as well. So, in terms of any questions that you might have, you can always contact the various offices that I've alluded to, whether it's the Academic Support Center, uh, main web page, as well as we have a special page that's specific for new students as well. Oops, that didn't work. Oh well. Uh, but uh, I will check on that as well. And so, uh, as well as the 21st Century Scholars Program. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and stop uh, our share at this point and just ask if uh, any of the tutors would want to uh, put out a couple of pieces of tips of information. Uh, with regard to uh, things that you wish you had known uh, when you were coming uh, to school. Uh, they can be specific about um, being successful in math courses. They can be more broad or general uh, in terms of any uh, pieces of advice you would want to uh, put out there in terms of being successful as you make the transition from high school to college. All right, I'm gonna go first. All right. Um, so, so mine will end in a very specific thing that you can, you can do, but um, allow yourself to make mistakes. Um, this, I, this is kind of math specific, but in everything it's fine. Um, mistakes are fine. When you make mistakes, you learn, you figure out what you did wrong, you can go from there, you can get help, but allowing yourself to make mistakes is really important and it's always been something that I've struggled with. If I can't get it the first time, I'm like, ah, oh, I must not know how to do it. But just allow yourself to make, make mistakes and allow yourself to grow. And on that point, get a dry erase board with a marker because I find it much easier to try something when I can quickly erase it or rather than when I'm like writing on a piece of paper, it feels a lot more permanent and it feels a lot more important. But when you have a dry erase marker, you can do whatever you want on there. And if you mess up, like, oh, just, just erase it, it's fine. That helped me a lot with like getting over my mentality that mistakes are okay. It's just having a space that you can quickly get rid of something if, if you find that you mess up. So I'd recommend getting a dry erase board. Thank you, Mallory. Anybody else want to throw in their two cents about uh, advice for the uh, incoming college student? I can go next. Um, so I think my general advice is just always to reach out for help, um, no matter as a professor or, uh, you know, like university, university uh, resources, like, you know, academic support center or 21st uh, scholar. So 21st century scholar. So because, you know, a lot of time I figure it's just like a lot of time people are too um, shy or too afraid to reach out for help and then but at the same time, they struggle, and then the result is just, you know, they never get out of the struggle. But I always find it very helpful to reach out, uh, especially, you know, the two I mentioned above, the, you know, the professor, because they know your courses, and you, you, if you get to know them uh, personally, it, you, a lot of time, I find myself enjoy the classes more, and then at the same time, they will, you know, give you some tips, some advices, things you can find very helpful in a specific class. And then for um, the other things like, you know, like math or your writing, always reach out to, you know, if you if you have problems, always reach out to tutors like, you know, like us, Camp Support Center, I feel like uh, this is a great resource that IU offers to students, you should take use of it. And, you know, also at the same time, because, you know, we are also students, uh, although we are tutors, but we're still students, so you can, when you come here, we ask a question. You also, you know, you get to know some more people on campus. You can ask them about things outside of your, you know, the classes you want to take. You can ask us about, you know, anything like, you know, like what we just talked earlier, like, you know, how do you choose professors or, or you know, other general advices. Um, tutors are, are here to help. So, yeah, just use the resources. Thanks, Owen. Uh, anybody else want to continue to build on that as well? 
I think the biggest thing that I had to learn in a college was knowing your limits as far as classes you want to take and like amount of work, like fully ask people the amount of work for a specific class you're going to take, like other students and stuff. Like, like rate your professor is great for like a general kind of overview, but look for other students feedback when you're looking like students like in your year who have recent experience with that professor. Because things, things change, and uh, this is a kind of basic one, but don't take too many credit hours. Don't do the whole, like, martyr yourself thing. Like, people like to say, I'm taking 18 credit hours. Woe is me. They made that decision. They thought that would be okay. And then they found out, oh, crap, everyone expects a lot of me in all eight of my classes. So, like, credit, credit count don't mean nothing. Just get the work done well. and keep focused on what you want to get out of college, not necessarily what a teacher wants you to do for a class. Kind of the add on to that, personally taking 18 credits and 21 credits per semester, it's pretty rough. Don't recommend that <laughs> unless you really have to. Yeah. Thanks for keeping it 100, everybody. Um, so uh, any other uh, kind of tips in terms of how to be successful uh, for, uh, for new students that people might want to also throw out there before we shift over to the post-test? The one general advice I have is, for me, I kind of recognize that one of the important things going through your university journey is uh, you're learning how to learn. And it's important to recognize that. And so let's say you fail your first math test. Take a step back and reflect upon your study habits, what worked, what didn't work. Because in university, they can't teach you everything you could possibly know in the real world. But they teach you the ability to learn. So you have to be able to reflect upon that. And I just, I encourage people to take a step back sometimes and think, am I really studying the proper way? Are these flashcards really the best way to do it? Am I doing all the practice problems I should be doing? Just have a lot of reflection, uh, when you, especially when you fail. And then to build on Ryan's, what he just said, like, yeah, coming into college, I did not do well in my first math exam in college. And it was like a good wake up call in that I need to develop new study habits from coming from high school. Because your study habits that you had in high school where it was easy, you barely have to do studying for some people and you can pull out a good grade is not going to be the thing for most people in college. So yeah, after like, and then if you flunk or do bad on an exam, it's not the end of the world though, because you can bounce back. Because in that class, I was able to bounce back, change my study habits, found a group of kids to study with for exams and do homeworks with, and everything turned out fine. So also building on that, don't isolate yourself either. Reach out for help, find people, because you're not the only one in the class that's struggling or needs help. So finding a good group of people in that class or people who have taken that class that can help you or going to tutoring, office hours, will just benefit you in the long run. That's gonna be so important this year, especially um, if, if we don't end up with in-person classes. Make a group me, reach out to the people on Canvas, make Zoom meetings. It's gonna to have to be a lot more proactive this year, I think, than the normal, but you can still make those things happen. Well, thanks y'all so much. That has been really useful information. And I always find that it's uh, very nice to hear directly from folks who have been ex who more recently experienced this, uh, kind of making this transition. And uh, I think all of your uh, pieces of advice and tips and strategies, um, and frankly, uh, reminding people that it's okay to make mistakes and that we're all going to do it and that those can often be some of the most beneficial experiences for us in terms of learning how how we study how to do better just allowing ourselves uh, that ability to do that so thank you very very much um, so at this point i'm going to go ahead and stop our cloud recording